but it didn't have to be that way. God restored my family in such a beautiful way. Like what I really wanted to get across in this time that we had together is that regardless of where anybody is at in whatever relationship they're in, Alcoholics Anonymous and this program and the God of our understanding can just revolution. It's a miraculous thing. It's a miraculous thing that can happen. Whether or not they stay in our lives or they don't, there can be peace, there can be love, there can be total forgiveness. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Greetings from Studio AA, deep in the heart of Texas. That was the voice of Marina that you heard at the beginning of this here episode, and you are going to hear so much more from her in just a moment. But first things first. First, this here episode is brought to you by David and Kate and Marcos and Marie and Michelle. What, you may ask, did David and Kate and Marcos and Marie and Michelle do? Well, they went to our website, www.soberspeak.com. They clicked on the little yellow donate tab and they made a a contribution, excuse me, my voice, I lost my voice there, a contribution. So thank you so much, David and Kate and Marcos and Marie and Michelle, this here episode is coming right out to Ewan's. So this particular episode is the first episode that will be released in the year 2023. So let me just say, if you haven't heard it a million times already, and I'm sure you have, uh, Happy New Year. And this is my uh, audio card, if you will, sent out to you with a great big Happy New Year and a great big happy audio hug coming out your way. All right, let's get into Marina. Marina is sober since October of 2010, and we are calling this episode Relationships Restored and Repaired. Uh... This particular episode is a real tearjerker. Marina describes it in detail, but her mother passed away right before we recorded this episode. So there is some raw, uh, authentic emotion that Marina was experiencing at the time, and she's probably still experiencing that. But Marina C. discusses discusses the relationship with her parents and all the twists and turns that that took over the years while drinking and in sobriety. She also talks about how her primary purpose shifted after arriving in Alcoholics Anonymous. Her unspoken prayer request, uh, how her dad, her father came to her rescue the two Cathy's, and I'll let you hear her talk about the two Cathy's, and also what she refers to as her AA tethers. I don't think I'd ever heard that before, and I liked it. So everybody, please sit back. Well, you know, if you're driving or whatever, you know, or if you're standing or if you're running, you don't really have to sit back. You get it. It's more of a figure of speech. Sit back, enjoy Marina, and we will have plenty of listener feedback at the end of this episode. Enjoy, Marina C. Oh, 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 and I almost... 
forgot before we get to Marina's episode, because this is the first episode of the new year 2023 we have a little special treat here for you and this is a song by mary lynn b it lasts about three minutes and it's called if i could only have one i am sure there are many of you that are out there that will be able to relate excuse me relate to that particular sentiment, if I could only have one. And uh, Mary Lynn has been kind enough to let us feature her music on the pod here. And she also has a, uh, a playlist on Spotify. It's called 12 Songs. They're all recovery based. It's things like Progress, Not Perfection, uh, Surrender is another title, uh, uh, Going to Any Lengths, uh, In These Rooms is another title. But anyway, you can go out there and listen to that. I will put the link to that uh, to that playlist and Spotify in the show notes here so you can listen to that uh, at your leisure. But anyway, we're going to play this song first by Mary Lynn. I know you're going to enjoy it, and then we will have... Uh, then Mary Marina's episode will start right after that song. Enjoy both Mary Lynn's song and Marina's episode. It wasn't a lie I'd have a drink with my friends A quick hello and then goodbye But two and turn to three I forgot about you and me I lost all track of time But you wouldn't pick up the phone This time I've gone too far Now I'm the one who's home alone Haunted by my mistakes A vicious cycle I can't break Why does the whiskey have control? And I can't help think about Okay, everybody. So today we're sitting here. There's the smiling face, Miss Marina. We're sitting here with Marina. Uh, Marina, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself, give you sobriety date if you wish, uh, and then tell people where you live in this great land of ours. 
Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm Marina and I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is October 5th, 2010. Uh, I'm very grateful for that date. I am living right now in the DFW area. I'm in North Richland Hills, Texas. However, I am currently in Granbury in a beautiful home with my friends. Uh, my my house is not available, so I came over here and, and I have a beautiful, nice house in Granbury. I love it here. So I'm really excited to be here speaking with you today. Thanks for having me. And I'm glad you're here. So let's go ahead and talk about your friend because that's kind of the way that we got. Well, well I've known you for quite some time. Yes. Uh, you, used to, you used to come to the Frisco group. I think you go to the Preston group now. Am I right about that? Well, um, actually, my home group has always been Language of the Heart in Colleyville, Texas. Um, I, I am a property manager, so I used to, for work, have different um, properties all over the DFW area. And I used to have one in McKinney. And so I'd go to the Frisco group there. And I also had one near the Preston group. So I go there quite a bit. And uh, now I no longer have a property over by you guys, but I still do have some in the, in the Dallas area. So I go to meetings all over Dallas, some in Arlington, you know, just all over the Metroplex. And I'm, I'm what I like to call a meeting hopper. And yeah. I just, I, I have such a blast going and getting to know the fellowship and hearing different people speak. And I have missed the Frisco group though. It was absolutely my top favorite group for a very, very long time. <laughs> and we miss seeing you too. So I hope you get another property over uh, by our way. So, so you said uh, you are in a, a lot of the listeners are going to, when you say you're in Granberry, a lot of the listeners are going to know who Don is, Don and Greg. So uh, just talk a little bit about y'all's relationship. So Don and I, um, I actually met her son, Alex first. And then I, I met Dawn and, you know, she and I, I saw her in meetings all the time and we just kind of connected sometimes, you know, Dawn works a kind of program where she is consistently reaching out to other women in the program. And so through the years, she would always kind of just touch base with me out of the clear blue sky and, Hey, how are you doing? Haven't heard from you in a while. And it was so sweet. And, uh, when COVID hit, I was no longer going to Frisco. I no, no longer had a property there. Um, but when COVID hit my, my sponsor that I had was unable to sponsor me anymore. And so all of a sudden, all the meetings were shut down. Nobody was going to in-person meetings anymore. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had never not had a sponsor. And I just felt like kind of out loose going, what, what's happening? And there was Dawn. She called me just one day. Hey, how's it going? And uh, we started chatting and I told her what had happened. And she said, why don't right now we just stay and touch with each other frequently so that you still know that, that you know, you've got that hand of AA there. And I said, okay. And I prayed about it and I, I actually asked her to go ahead and be my sponsor. And, you know, I, it's funny how God works because she and I have, uh, very, we're very close in our birthdays. And so typically I would have wanted, you know, I would have thought to myself, well, I need to have a sponsor with a lot more sobriety than I do. And I need to have a sponsor that this and that, you know, the little list that we make. And, God took away all my choices and then he just presented Don. And I got to say that, uh, having Don as my sponsor has brought me further into sobriety, into recovery, into the, the fellowship and the way that we are of service to one another and the community of other women in a way that far surpasses the, the previous years that I was sober. And so I'm so grateful that God linked us up and put us together. So even though she lives in Granbury, I'm over here all the time or she comes up to see me and we've got a whole tribe of women around us over here. So it's just great. <laughs> That's fantastic. So I want to just real quick, when you, when you would say your name at meetings, Marina, it took me a little while to figure out what you were saying. I'm not used to hearing the name Marina. Do you know a lot of other Marinas? No, there's not a whole lot of us. So the, the origin of my name is, is kind of unique. My grandfather on my mother's side, his name was Maurice. And so my mother was named after him Maureen. And so her name is Maureen. And my father, when he came to the States, he was Hispanic. He moved to the States in college and he could not pronounce her name because only, he only spoke Spanish. And so he called her <laughs> Marina. And so I was named after my grandfather, mother, then me, Marina, Marina. And in, in <laughs> Spanish, they called me everywhere. My family always called me Marinita. 
my mother was Marina and I was Marinita, little Marina. So that's where I got my name. Although it ends up being a Russian name. Who knew? But that's not, I'm not Russian. <laughs> I'm a Latina. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Now I know the history of your name. I yeah. was always wondering about that. I want to write on the front of this, go ahead and kind of get this out of the way. Uh, as you know, we've been scheduled to record this, I don't know, co a couple of months or something like that. Yeah. No one could have predicted uh, what happened with you in your life this week. So why don't you, and, and I talked to you about it and I was, I was like, hey, if you need to reschedule, I'm more than fine with this, but you wanted to go ahead and move forward. So why don't you tell people what uh, occurred in your life this week? Um, well, I, I, uh, I lost my mother. She passed away. And so it's been really, really hard. She and I were very close. And I, you know, when it happened, I wasn't sure what to do. And I prayed about it, about, you know, when it came to speaking and I called Dawn, actually, I called my sponsor, and I just kind of processed it a little bit with her. And when you go through something so significant, uh, not only did I lose my mom uh, the Sunday before last Sunday, but I also lost my father this year. And, and so losing both parents, it hit me really hard. Both were sudden and unexpected and um, very painful. So I didn't know, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Do I reschedule? I knew that you were going to be very, you know, grace, gracious. I knew that wouldn't be a problem, but I didn't know if I was supposed to. And Don just said, you know what? It's okay to just be real. It's okay to be transparent. When we're asked to speak, that's, uh, you know, God's work. And I'm supposed to be able to speak. And, and she told me, you never know who's going to be listening right now, who either is going through a loss or needs to hear something for when they do go through a loss in sobriety. Because the bottom line is that we lose our loved ones. Nobody gets out of death, you know, and our parents aren't going to be around forever, period. And so I am working very hard to go through this in a way that that can help others and also I have a 15 year old son and so I have to ask myself how can I show my son how to grieve and how to get on the other side of it and I love that AA has taught me that I always have there's a solution always number one and I have a responsibility I have a responsibility to be of service and so how can I be of service through this devastating time in my life and so because of that I, the conversation with Don, my prayer, I decided I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to speak today. Um, I think that it's what I'm supposed to be doing. I think it's what God wants me to do. Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, and I was kind of of uh, the same mindset. Obviously, I wouldn't, you know, force you into doing anything like this. But I was thinking, though, that, I mean, this is life, right? And this is there, there are a lot of people that I'm sure when they are listening to this have experienced the same thing recently, uh, or they will experience the same thing coming up, um, and they'll be able to relate to this. And I, I appreciate you. Okay, so let's let's go back to the the uh, beginning, I guess, right? Yeah, right. Where? Tell me where you want to start in terms of your story. Go ahead. So, you know, for me, when I was thinking about being on here and speaking with you and then suddenly losing my mother and having both of my parents gone, I was reviewing the past and reviewing my life and, and really looking at where it all began. Now, when I first got sober, I listened in meetings and I heard a lot of people talk about their where they started drinking. And nobody knows, right, wh what makes us alcoholic. Is it genetic? Is it our environment? Is it, you know, along the way of partying too much, all of a sudden it switches? My childhood was very um, dysfunctional. And my parents did the best that they could. But my father was also an alcoholic. He and I shared the disease. And we shared recovery together for, for quite some time. Um, but before he was sober, it was not fun in my house. Uh, he was a workaholic. He, he raged quite a bit. So there was some abuse there. And my mother um, struggled 
with uh, some another form of a mental illness. She was bipolar and manic depressive. And so there were times in my life when she would be um, depressed. She would either go up to a high manic phase, and then after a manic phase, she'd dive deep into a deep, deep depression. And she, uh, a few times here and there, was suicidal and had to be hospitalized. And so at a very young age, my world was unsteady. And uh, my mother was hospitalized for the first time when I was nine years old. And I was told that she had um, a bad back, something had happened to her back. And so my dad had to take care of us and take time off of work. And, and at that time, a lot of people didn't know as much as they do now about mental health and the different illnesses and diseases that come. And so we were, uh, we went to go visit my mother. And I remember thinking, I don't understand. Like, there's no sick people. Like, I, they're not physical ailments. My mom was sitting and talking, and she didn't seem like she had a bad back. And she was room, a roommates with a person who very much scared me, talked really weird and very fast and very spastic and didn't seem stable. And so that roommate scared me, and the other people in this place scared me. And um, I learned at a young age, in order to self-protect, to be invisible, I would be very silent, and I would listen a lot. And so I, I tried to stay under the radar. I didn't want to get in the line of my dad when he was angry. And I liked to hear what they were always talking about so that then I could know what I needed to do to protect myself. And so one day when we were at the hospital, I remember I was listening to my mother and my father and they were arguing. And my dad said, you don't know what it's like to have to sit there and be the mother and the father while, you, while you're over here taking an effing vacation. And my mom replied with, you don't know what it's like to have to drop the kids off at school and go and rent movies all day long and watch the movies all day long so that I don't kill myself. And in that moment, my life changed forever. And I thought, okay, my mom might kill herself. And I got very full of fear. And we were driving home from the hospital. My dad had no idea that he that I heard that conversation. And I have an older sister and a younger brother. We're all close in age. We were all three in the back seat, and we were kind of messing around with each other. Who knows what kids being kids? And my dad said, "Cut it out! Stop it!" And then he said, "You see, you guys, this is why your mother's in the hospital because you guys act like this." And so another truth came over me. Not only is my mom going to kill herself, but it's my fault. And so I was drenched in shame. I know that now. At the time, I had no idea. All I know is that I felt sick to my stomach. I felt very fearful. And I thought to myself, what can I do to ensure that my mom doesn't, doesn't do that? And I got home and I told my sister and she told my mother that I had heard. And my mom called me and she said, Marina, I promise I'm so sorry that you heard that. And you guys mean everything to me. The reason why I'm not killing myself is because I love you so much. And that was a nice thing to say. But what I heard was, it's my responsibility to make sure that she lives. And so that's what I did. I became her confidant, her best friend. There was no boundaries. It was very enmeshed. I needed to try to make sense and try to make things seem normal when there was a lot of insanity going on. And so when I got into the program, I looked back at my childhood and I pointed a finger and I said, that's probably why I'm an alcoholic. It's their fault. It's, it's their fault that this has happened to me. Um, I don't know that I believe that anymore. Um, I think that alcoholism is in a long line of my, my family, uncles, grandparents, my dad, it just is what it is. There doesn't have to. There doesn't need to be a finger pointed anywhere. Uh, the bottom line is, I started drinking. I started drinking at that time when I was nine. I started taking sips of liquor out of my dad's cabinet. I started looking for different ways to to slip something. I came, like I said, from a a very large Hispanic family on my dad's side. When we would go to Mexico to visit my family, oh, it was these parties that they would have. I have, you know, like over a hundred cousins and beautiful, glamorous music and dancing. And my uncles, my tios would always be, I could always count on them to slip me uh, some cerveza, you know? And so I'd take some and I'd be, <laughs> oh, I'm so excited, you know? Oh, I'm like a grown up, you know? I felt very glamorous in that way. 
Um, you know, that's me. interesting. I, mm-hmm. I, and I don't know if you're going to get to this, but I do remember one of the, I've heard you share many times in meetings. And one of the things that I remember you sharing was that you were sitting at a kitchen table one day with you, I think in your brother. And then there was somebody else in the room, like a friend of the family, and you were smoking a cigarette. <laughs> And you said you felt very glamorous. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So we had moved to El Paso when I was uh, 13. No, 12. Moved to El Paso. And in El Paso, it's a border town. So you can walk at the age of 12 and 13 right over the border and right into a bar. And so a lot of my friends, their parents let them drink. Not a lot of them, a couple of them. And I remember I went to this one girl's house and we were there and I was smoking a cigarette and I felt so sophisticated. And the the mother had a roommate and he was telling me, oh, girl, look at you. You're just so beautiful. And when you get older, I can just imagine. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, I was so excited. But the truth of the matter is I was a 13 year old child drinking and smoking a cigarette. And as an adult, I've looked at a 13 year old going, what was that man talking about? <laughs> There's nothing beautiful or sophisticated. There's nothing about that but sickness. You know, 13-year-old children look like children. They don't need to have cigarettes or alcohol in their system. And so I'll never forget, but there was something about it because I felt so less than. You know, I had so much shame and I felt, you know, defective. I felt like I could never fit in. Fit in. And so I constantly was putting on masks always like, who do you need me to be so that then I can be accepted by you? It's what I call, I was other esteemed. I had to be okay. You, I had to make sure that you guys were all okay with me in order for me to feel okay with me. And anytime I got a compliment, all of a sudden I'd be like, oh, okay, I'm okay. Anytime somebody said, oh, you're so likable. Oh, okay. I'm okay. And when I drank it, it was so easy to be in a group of people. When I wasn't drinking, it was really hard for me to be in a group of people. And, um, and so I, I just loved it. It was, it was exciting. And I drank all through my teens. I drank alcoholically all through my teens. By the time I was 15 in health class, I came across, um, the word functioning alcoholic. And I thought, Oh, bam. That's, that, that's what I'll do. I'll be a functioning, I'll, I'll drink however much I want. That's what I thought. You can drink as much as you want, but you're still going to be able to get your life together and get it done. And so everything's going to be okay. So that's <laughs> what I labeled myself at 15. I also remember at the age of 15, I had a dream. It was a very bad nightmare dream and it was dealing with alcohol. And I woke up and I knew, I knew that I wasn't ever supposed to drink. There was something inside of me. I, I, to me today, I know that it was the God of my understanding that showed me then and there, you're never supposed to drink. And I also knew I'm drinking again. And I, I drank alcoholically for 19 years and it went from being very fun and very, um, glamorous, I guess, and exciting. And then in my college years, it got ugly and I ended up failing out of school. And, uh, by the time I was 28 or 29, I was a divorced single mother. Um, I had my son that I needed to take care of and I didn't know how I was going to take care of him. And all along the way, my relationship with my parents remained very unhealthy. My father and I, we butted heads like this all the time with being best friends with my mom Um, and her telling me all kinds of things that I didn't have any business knowing my parents during their divorce, my dad became the enemy. And there were times when he and I didn't speak to each other for, uh, you know, a year or so at a time we wouldn't speak. And then my family would force us to get back together. But then also with my mother, I was very (sighs) annoyed and frustrated. I, I didn't want to have to listen to the things that she would tell me. It made me very uncomfortable, but I felt forced to. And so I'll, I'll never forget. There was a time when a friend of mine went over to my mom's house with me. She had never met my mother. I was in my twenties at this point and she came into the house. And when we left, I left quickly 
And she said, gosh, what was wrong with you? I said, what do you mean? She said, everything about you changed. You went from just being relaxed and normal. And the moment you stepped in that house, the tension was there. It was like you were almost like there was a vibration and energy going off of you that was like tense and uncomfortable and like you wanted to flee. And my mom used to call me a butterfly. She would say, you come in, you fly in because butterflies never stay in one spot for very long. You'd come and you'd land really quick and then you'd fly away. And you're, you'd just come and you'd barely fly in and then you'd land for a minute and then you'd fly away because I, my tolerance level was so low for my parents. And, and uh, I had so many judgments and then it was just, you know, the enmeshment and all of it was very sick. And so when I had my son, that was the first time in my life where everything shifted. I saw something so clearly. I loved my son. I don't know that I ever loved anything before I had my son other than I, I was, I don't think I loved myself. I think I was just selfish and self-centered, whatever I wanted, however I was going to get it. That's all I wanted to do. My primary purpose was to just drink and have a good time. And all of a sudden I had this, this little thing, this little creature. And I'll never forget the moment that the love of a mother rushed over me. And sometimes for women and parent and fathers, the love comes gradually. Sometimes it's instantaneously. For me, it was very instant. And I remember, I, oh my gosh, I'm so happy. And oh my gosh, I'm so afraid. Because I knew that I was going to seriously harm my child if I continued to live the lifestyle that I was living. And so at that point, I had to make a decision of, oh, how am I going to not drink the way I drink? And so I knew that I needed God in my life. Now, growing up, my mom taught me a very important lesson. She taught me about having a relationship with God, not about religion, although she took me to some crazy freaking churches. But, <laughs> <laughs> but she taught me about a real relationship, how to speak to God and how to try to hear from God. I always wanted to ignore what God was telling me because he was always trying to tell me maybe it's not a good idea to steal money to drink, you know, <laughs> maybe it's not a good idea to drink till a blackout. Um, but whenever I'd be super hung over and in so much pain, my hangovers were the worst. I would pray and ask God, God, how, I just, I'm, so, I'm in a lot of pain. What help me, help me. And, and so I, I would, always want to listen, but I, I wasn't willing to. And I, instead I would want God come with me and do things my way. And even in this moment when I was like, Oh, my son, i love him so much. I'm going to have to figure this out. I prayed and I knew I need God back in my life. So I started praying and I knew I wasn't supposed to drink. And I remember like I would be laying there and the thought would come in AA. And my response was never. <laughs> uh, and so I thought, okay, well, I'm willing to go to church. You know, there's this thing that we do, uh, that some of us will do. And I've, I've read about it in the book about bargaining, you know, okay, God, I, I'm not going to do that, but I, I'm willing to go to church. And so I found a church and I started going to church and I thought maybe by going to church, I'll be able to drink like a normal person. Well, that didn't work. And so after that, I thought, okay, I, I'm going to buy a Bible. I, I'm going to buy a Bible. And I'm going to start reading the Bible. And then maybe that's going to be the magic cure for my, you know, out of control drinking. And so I started reading the Bible and I started listening to Bible studies and, and, and different pastors. And, and all the while there, anytime somebody would say, do you have a prayer request or anything like that? I would say, oh, I have an unspoken prayer request because I didn't want to say I'm trying to stop drinking and I don't know how. And I never wanted to admit it. And so I kept this little secret and I kept trying to figure out ways to control it without just submitting to what I knew God wanted me to do. And, uh, and that lasted for three years, really trying and failing again and again and again. And by the time my, my son was three years old, he was getting to the age where he was going to really start remembering some stuff. And I'll never forget... Uh, the day that I was driving, I had dropped my son off with my father. My father had gotten sober by this point. He had decided to start going to meetings, and that's all I knew. He wasn't drinking, and he was going to these AA meetings. And I was just 
observing from afar that he was able to stay sober and I could actually trust my son with him. So I dropped him off at my dad's house and I went to go drink with some acquaintances. When I was driving in the car, I heard so clearly a thought in my mind that just burst out of nowhere. And the thought was, if you don't stop what you're doing, something really bad is about to happen. And I knew that thought did not come from me. I don't know what's going on right now, but I know that that thing that will be bad has to do with my son. Because one week prior, I had gone out with an acquaintance somewhere. I never had real friends by this point. I had gone out with some people that I was working with. I had dropped my kid off at this babysitter's house. And at 11 p.m., I had blacked out at the bar. And I came to at 4 o'clock in the morning. And my son was sleeping in my arms. We were in the room together in, our, in my bed. And I had no recollection of driving to pick him up. I have no idea what I said to the babysitter. Oh, how I, I don't know how I got my kid in the car, driving home, walking up the stairs, all of that. At any minute, he could have died. This is the thing that I loved more than anything in the world. And I was placing him in a position to be killed because of me. And the shame and the guilt and the remorse that I felt when I woke up at four o'clock and I thought, that's it. I will never drink again. Never. And one week later, I was driving to a bar and I had dropped my son off at my dad's house. And that thought came in and it was true. I knew that the gig was up. I knew, okay, what do I do? And so I had to pray and I had to ask myself, who am I going to tell? Like, what, what am I going to do? Now, I knew that my dad had been sober. It was coming up on, I don't know, six months, maybe, maybe a year or something. I think a year. And I, but I knew I didn't want to tell my dad. There's no way I wanted to call and tell my dad because once you tell a family member mm -hmm. that you've got a drinking problem, the gig is, that's it. It's, there's no turning back. You can't say, never mind, you know? <laughs> and I was willing to tell somebody I was scared and had a problem, but I wasn't quite ready to dive in head first like that yet. And so I was like, God, who do I tell? Who do I tell? And the name, um, Bobby kept coming into my mind. Now, Bobby was a, an acquaintance of mine at church. He and I sang on the praise team at church. And as soon as that, that thought Bobby came into my mind, I was like, Oh no, no, I can't tell Bobby. He's going to go tell everybody at my church and everybody's going to know. And I'm going to be humiliated. Absolutely not. But for two days, I wrestled still drinking with my son in the one bedroom apartment that from the bar from that I was driving to the bar and I heard that thought, it didn't stop me from drinking. I kept on drinking that next day. I kept on drinking, but I was thinking about it. I'm going to tell somebody, I'm going to tell somebody. And for two straight days, I wrestled with what I say, my higher power. I wrestled. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, but I was so afraid and in so much pain. And I knew it was time that finally, I made the call and for about 10 minutes of crying on the phone with this guy, I finally croaked out, you know, I, I am, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I think I have a drinking problem. And for some reason, I think I'm supposed to tell you. And he said, Oh, Marina, it's, don't worry, girl. You called the right person. I've been sober for years and mm. I had no idea that he was in recovery. Mm -hmm. And he said, the first time I met your dad wasn't at church. The first time I met your dad was at an AA meeting oh. and you need to get to an AA meeting as soon as possible. Can you go today? And I was like, I've been drinking for two days. I can't do anything, but go to bed today. And he said, <laughs> go to bed and tomorrow get to a meeting. And I said, okay. So after I hung up the phone with him, I fell asleep. And the next morning I woke up with a hangover from hell and I picked up the phone and I called my father. And I said, Dad, I've been drinking nonstop. I can't stop. I'm scared. I've hit my bottom, and I don't know what to do. And he said, I'm on my way. And he came. He came to my rescue. And I was so grateful because there was no judgment. There was no lecture. There was nothing other than care. And he loaded me and my kid up in the car, and he drove me to language of the heart. And he took me there and he said he was, he, I don't know if he tricked me or not. He took me right at about noon. It was a little afternoon. And he said he was just going to get a phone list of women's names 
And then the meeting had already started. <laughs> and suddenly he said, get inside and go to the meeting. I'm like, what? I can't go to the meeting. Look, <laughs> look at me. I don't have any makeup on. I've been crying for two days and drinking for two days. And he looked at me and he said, Marina, get inside that meeting now. And for the first time, I was willing to listen. And I was willing to let go of my desires because the fear of hanging on to the bottle was greater than the fear of letting it go. I was always afraid of letting the bottle go. But now the fear of holding on to it was just so great that I said, okay. So I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'll never forget, I sat down and I looked around and everybody was, I, I didn't know what to expect, but it wasn't normal, beautiful faces of all ages and having just a nice little lunch break and smiling and laughing. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And here I am cracked out with my, just, I looked a mess. I was just a disaster. And I thought I was going to vomit at any time. And I was looking around for the restroom in case I needed to go throw up. Oh my gosh. I'll never forget. And they started going around the room and they started to share. And I remember thinking, oh no, they're going to come to me. I cannot, I cannot be here. So I, I left, I ran away. I ran out the door and two women followed me out. And there are certain people when you come into recovery that stay with you forever. You know, sometimes it's something that you hear in a meeting. Sometimes it's a speaker meeting. Sometimes it's just a, a person, but they're not in my life anymore. But those two women will hold a special place in my heart for the rest of my life. And I love them with every inch of my being because they saved me. They're, both of their names were Kathy. And they came outside and they asked if I was okay. And I said, I'm not okay. And I, I, I started telling the truth. I was the liar of all liars. And the liar of all liars said, I'm going to tell the truth. And it just started coming out of me. I don't know what to do. I can't stop drinking. I showed them my hands that were shaking constantly at this point. I told them how I couldn't care for my son. And instead of being looked at and told you're the worst mother ever. And we're calling CPS immediately. That's what I thought might happen. And I thought that's what I deserved. I saw such compassion and understanding in their faces. And I saw that they really cared and understood. And one of them said, I have an answer there. All you need to do, the, 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 the room is the answer. Alcoholics Anonymous is the answer. You go inside these rooms, you get a sponsor, you work the steps and guess what? Life doesn't have to be miserable anymore. I've had a better time in sobriety than I ever did drinking because that's what we wonder, right? We wonder, gosh, I'm going to come in here. My life is going to suck. I'm going to be so <laughs> bored all the time. How am I going to get through anything? And it was October, like it was, it, uh, that was actually August and the holidays were just right around the corner. And I'm thinking I can't be sober during the holidays, but I needed to do something. And so the next day I went back. I got a sponsor. I started working the steps and the most beautiful thing happened for me. I, huh, I started little ways of being more and more free. You know, like at first it was like day 15. I'll never forget day 15 because in 19 years, the longest I ever went without drinking was 14 days. And so on day 15, I thought, Oh man, this thing might actually work. You know? I can't believe it. And I didn't like sharing. I didn't want to share. I never spoke at all. I would just go and I'd sit down and listen because I had to get like the lay of the land. Like, what are people saying? <laughs> what are they doing over here? What mask do I need to put on? Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and then my sponsor told me that I had to start sharing. She was like, no, you can't just go in there and take, take, take. You have to be of service and you have to start opening up your mouth and speaking. And so I'll never forget on day 15 was my first day that I spoke. And I said, Hi, my name is Marina and I'm an alcoholic. I don't really have much to say. Just, it feels really nice not to be hung over and to have a clear head. It feels really good. I remember it like it was yesterday, that little bit of freedom. And then a little bit longer in the program, another little bit of freedom. And one area that I stayed trapped in for the first 30 or so days was um, the desire to drink. It was still very, very strong inside of me. When I went into the meetings, I thought, maybe I'll give myself a year. Let's just see how it goes after that. Maybe a year. I'll try to do a year. And there were a couple of things about um, 
that Alcoholics Anonymous taught about like the allergy and that the disease would stay the same right where it was at, regardless of how long you're sober. If you pick up again, you're going to be right where you left off. I didn't like, I was like, what are you talking about? Like if I'm allergic to a peanut and I take a peanut, my throat swells up. I don't ever want a peanut again. So what's this thing about an allergy and having that, those little doubts and still missing the what I called the glamour, you know, the fantasy of what drinking was, uh, it caused me to go back out. I had about 30 something days and I, I relapsed and I told myself I was only going to have a beer. And now I never told my, myself that before going into AA. I always knew I wanted to drink like a drinker, you know, I wanted to have a good <laughs> time. But this time I was like, I'm only going to have one drink. Two days went by. Another nonstop two days of like I was a robot. It, 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 it took off exactly where it had lift up, left off. I remember thinking in my mind, oh, this is kind of what they said. But it was like I was on autopilot. I, it didn't stop me from drinking. I didn't like the way that it tasted. My wine that I used to just, mm, no, I was so bougie with my wine. It was, <laughs> it was hideous. It tasted so disgusting. And so instead of saying, maybe I don't need to drink anymore, I was like, maybe I need to get a different brand. And so I tried like multiple <laughs> brands in the two days that I was just wasted. And God did for me what I could not do for myself. That second night I came to and, uh, I looked over and my son was like playing on my cell phone and he accidentally called my sponsor. <laughs> oh my gosh, my sponsor. And so I hear kind of in the haze, he's kind of talking. I hear my sponsor, Christian, is that you? Is your mommy there? I'm like, oh Lord, here we go. I'm in trouble now. <laughs> so, I, so I get on the phone. She was like, hello. And I'm like, Hey, I messed up. And she goes, I figured, haven't heard from you in two days. I'm like, yeah, I drank again. She goes, is there any alcohol left in the house? And I said, yes. And she said, are you ready to pour it out? And I said, yes. And so I took, and for the first time ever in my life, I poured out half a bottle of wine and I put it down and she said, are you ready to go to bed? I said, yes. And she said, call me in the morning. And that next morning I woke up and I was ready. Oh, I was ready to fight. I knew in that moment, if this is the best that alcohol is ever going to give me and it's only going to get worse from here, I don't want it anymore. I'm going to go down just giving it my all. If this, I will never fight like I'm going to fight right now. And I got up and I went right to a meeting and I reestablished. But what was so interesting is that I was so ready to do battle in a way that I had never done battle before. And that was the moment that the battle was over because the desire to drink was gone and it has not returned in 12 years. Now it's not because of that moment that the drink, the desire to drink hasn't returned, but that moment is when step one was completely done and step one has continued to be done in my life. But I have stayed in the program fully and I have done the things that my sponsor has suggested and I've been of service and I've done the steps and I still do the steps and I, ha I have a sponsor and I sponsor women. And so I became free at that time, right? And that, that of the drink. And they say, don't leave until the miracle happens. And I'm thinking, okay, oh, the miracle has happened. But you know what? That is, that, that is just one of many, many miracles, many miracles. And, and I, as I stay, more and more freedom has happened and more and more freedom is going to continue to happen. And one of the areas that I want to finish up on is the area of the relationship that I had with my parents. Because I came into this program and I really started listening and learning and where, where it talks about here, it says on page 100 of the big book, and that's in, in working with others, it, said, it says, follow the dictates of a higher power and you will presently live in a new and wonderful world no matter what your present circumstances, right? So just follow what it is that we're supposed to be doing. And so that's what I did. And I started, it was easier with my dad because he and I, we were, um, you know, we were working a program together. And so we walked the steps together. We went to meetings together. He used to save me a seat at meetings all the time. And I'd go and sit down. Everybody knew that we were father and, and daughter. And I remember one time, in a meeting, he said, you know, I thought that 
um, sharing recovery with my daughter would be icing on the cake. He said, no, man, it's a whole other cake. And that's what it was like for me too. It's like, it was such a joy. All of, we got, we got, um, all of the wreckage of the past. We cleared away between the two of us in such an easy way because we understood, we spoke the same language. And so he changed so drastically and I changed so drastically. And so we just walked hand in hand. And then he, for whatever reason, didn't get it all the way. And he started struggling and he relapsed. Um, he relapsed off and on through the years and he would come back in every time. And it was so interesting because, you know, my dad was the hand of AA for me when I first got sober and I first needed someone. And I was able to be the hand of AA for him on a number of occasions where I would say, come on, let's go back. Come on, let's go back. And the last year or so, I saw that he really started struggling and his sobriety was getting less and less and his disease was getting worse and worse. And on January 14th, um, I, I hadn't heard from him in a couple of days. And I thought, oh, I wonder where he's at. And I started reaching out to my siblings and asking them, where's dad? Have you heard from dad? And my sister said, well, I saw him on Tuesday. And Abraham, my brother, said, oh, I saw him on Sunday. And I was like, oh, something's wrong. We need to do a wellness check. And so I was at work, and I had a wellness check done on him. And I got a call, and they said that they found him on the floor of his apartment, and he had fallen down the stairs. And so I jumped in my car, and I raced over to the apartment, and I was praying the whole time, God, please don't take my dad. Please don't take my dad. And, and I got there, and he had died. He had died about 24 hours before. And... I was so heartbroken and I remember the next day getting up and saying, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? My dad and I were so close, so close. And I got up and I went and I sat down and I did my prayer and meditation and I cried to God and I said, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? My dad, you know, my dad, my dad, what am I going to do? And I went to a meeting. And I sat down and I listened and I was actually able to laugh. Somebody said something. I don't remember what it was, but I remember thinking, oh, I can't believe I just laughed on the worst day of my life. I was able to laugh. And then I called my sponsor and then I was surrounded by the, the fellowship of AA and you guys just carried me through it, you know? And it's like we are taught to do these things every single day so that it's so ingrained in us and it's such a habit that when things really go wrong, I woke up clueless of what to do, but I was on autopilot in a very healthy way. And I was able to get right back into the program. And so the last 10 months, I remember thinking, man, I'm so glad that my dad and I had made peace with everything between the two of us. There was nothing left undone, nothing left unsaid. And I was grateful that God took my father quickly. I think that maybe my higher power knew that my father was never going to be able to say yes to sobriety again. And so he said, okay, come home. And he fell down the stairs. And I hate the idea of him falling down the stairs. But my dad didn't know he fell down the stairs. To him, it was just instantaneous. All of a sudden, he was gone. He doesn't. There, the doctor said that there was nothing, just bam, gone. And that's a beautiful thing for my dad. You know, he didn't have to suffer. He didn't have, I was so afraid that maybe he was laying there for like a day, but no, he wasn't. He was just gone. And I have felt my dad around me almost every day, little things that will happen. And I'll be like, oh, that's you, old man. I know that's you, old viejo. And, you know, and so it, the, the relationship is still there. It's a little different. And with my mother, there was still some things like our relationship had healed and I, and I had gotten to the point where she came to my house once a week and we spent really good quality time together, but, but there were still some judgments and there were still some times when she would say, I learned how to have really good boundaries with her and she would come up and she would want to like talk to me about things that, you know, I don't need to be hearing about. And I'd be like, mom, mom, remember that's a boundary. Like we don't talk about that stuff. <laughs> and, and, but it would still kind of irk me just a little bit. But when I lost my dad, there was a gift that God gave me, and it was a change in perspective of the way that I viewed my mother. And all of a sudden, I viewed her as this precious gift. 
And I saw her, I think maybe the way God saw her and the judgments just were gone. And the things that she wanted to talk to me about her politics, you know, when I just started, they didn't bother me. I'm like, talk away, woman, it's okay. And she wanted to say things that really, you know, whatever. And our relationship got so close over the last 10 months. I took her on trips. I got to see this 75 year old woman get on a horse and go horseback riding for the first time in 30 plus years. I took care of her. We became to be really true friends. And on Sunday, October 23rd, my mom woke up and she listened to me sing at church. And she texted me afterwards and she said, Oh, Marina, you did so beautifully. I'm so proud of you. And then she came to my house and she was, she came over. My sister came too. We watched a movie together. I got her her favorite snacks. I caught her up on everything. I told her about this podcast that I was going to do. And I, we laughed and we just were together. And I remember she put her hand on my leg and she grabbed my sister's hand and she said, Oh, being with my girls brings me such joy. And I, she left my house at five o'clock and I gave her the biggest hug and I gave her a kiss on the cheek and I said, I'll see you on Wednesday. And she went home and at 1030 at night, my stepfather called and he said, I found your mother on the laundry room floor and she wasn't breathing. And I did CPR until the ambulance got there and they were able to get her heart beating again. But Marina, I'm really scared. They're on their way to the ER. And I said, okay, I'm on my way. And I started praying right then. Please, God, don't take them both. Please, God, don't take them both. Not in the same year. And I got to the hospital. I'm sorry. You're fine. I got to the hospital. I got to the hospital. And I ran inside and I got my stepfather and my son was with me and my sister was on her way. And the doctor came in. And he said, there are some decisions that are going to have to be made. Your mother has no brain activity and she is just going to continue to decline. She's not going to leave this hospital and it's just about a matter of time. <clears throat> How long do you want this to go on? I can give her some medication to bring her blood pressure up, but it's going to strain her. It's going to strain her organs. We think she had a pulmonary embolism and it stopped her heart. And if it were me and it were my wife, who I love with all of my heart, I would go into that room right now and I would say my goodbyes and I would let her go peacefully and not allow her body to have to go through that. And I looked at my stepfather and I said, what do you want to do? And he said, I don't know. And my, my son said, is there any, have you ever seen somebody come out of this uh, to the doctor? Has there ever been anybody that you've seen that has been in this condition that has left? And the doctor said, no, I've never experienced it. And so I knew in that moment, I need to go say goodbye to my mom. And I said, God, you're going to have to help me get through this. And so we went over and my sister got there right in time and we surrounded my mother. And we got to say the things that we wanted to say. And I got to hold her and I got to give her a kiss on the forehead. And I got to cry and tell her that it was okay and that I would make sure that we would be okay. And it was an honor to be able to be there in my mom's last moment. She was there for my first breath. And I was there for her last breath. And there was nothing that needed to be resolved. There was only love. Everything was okay between the two of us. And that was a beautiful, beautiful gift. And the next day I woke up and I was like, almost wanting to be angry. God, how could you possibly allow this to happen? And in that moment, I had a decision to make. Who was the God of my understanding going to be? Was he going to be the God of my understanding that I've had the last 12 years? Or was I suddenly going to change him and make him the enemy? And for me, my higher power is non-changing, completely unchanging, always good, always merciful. And I prayed and I asked him, why, why would you do this? And I remembered the conversation that I had with my mom right before she left my house. She told me, Marina, the darkness is trying to get me again. I'm fighting it though. I'm trying really hard to get out of the pit of despair, but it wants me and I'm a little bit scared and I don't want to tell your stepdad about it because I don't want him to worry, but I'm just letting you know, I'm fighting the good fight, honey, and I'm going to try my best and I'm going to call the doctor and see if I need to get on different medication, but depression was trying to get over her again. And when my mom went through depression, she became suicidal 
And I remember that moment and I was like, oh, she didn't need to fight the fight again. She didn't need to go down there again. I see mercy again. I see that God took her quickly and pain free again. She was just there one minute and gone the next. And I see that that is a beautiful gift. And I, so for me, it's all about like the perspective of the way that I can view it. I, I can either say this is awful and life sucks, or I can say the last 12 years enabled me to be intentional with my parents and there with my parents and the relationship was totally restored. I mean, the kind of childhood that I had, it would be excusable for a child to never want to be around their parents, but it didn't have to be that way. God restored my family in such a beautiful way. And so what I wanted to say, like what I really wanted to get across in this time that we had together is that regardless of where anybody is at in whatever relationship they're in, Alcoholics Anonymous and this program and the God of our understanding can just revolution. It's a miraculous thing. It's a miraculous thing that can happen. Whether or not they stay in our lives or they don't, there can be peace, there can be love, there can be total forgiveness. And so I am just really grateful that I had the opportunity to be the daughter that I always wanted to be to my parents and that they became beautiful people for me too. I'm grateful that I stayed sober and I'm very grateful that not once during this time have I ever wanted to have a drink. It hasn't come across my mind. I just haven't, I haven't needed it. My AA family has been there for me. And it's very weird when you lose both of your parents, all of a sudden you realize that what tethered you to this world isn't there anymore. And you feel a little bit lost. And I thought, where do I belong? I belong here. And AA tethers me. My God tethers me. And I'm so, so grateful for that. And so that's just kind of what I wanted to, to speak on today. <laughs> well, thank you, Marina. That was fantastic. God bless you. I so much appreciate you coming on in this you know, time of distress. Uh, and I know, I know that the listeners are going to benefit from this greatly. And you. you're, you're incredible. I always end it with uh, page 164 from the big book. Great. And it says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge, like me and Marina, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Once again, Marina, uh, so grateful, so Thank grateful you. for you coming on today. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it, John. God bless you. Once again, Marina, it was a pleasure spending time with you. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, strength, and hope with the Sober Speak audience. I know that they are going to enjoy it. Um, and if you are listening out there, remember, we don't want you sharing your gossip, but we would love to have you share this episode with a friend or family member. Keep in mind, it may be just what they need today. All right. Now on to a little bit of a listener feedback. Stefan, I think it's Stefan. I'm pretty sure this is how you pronounce it. Stefan writes in, he says, hi, John, thanks for accepting me into the super secret Facebook group. Well, Stefan, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for joining us. He says, I started listening to your podcast while I was living, living in the Eastern Arctic or uh, on Baffin Island. I spent nearly 30 years living and walking across the frozen tundra. I recently made it back to more southern climates in the highlands near the state of Maine. Although I was attending several online meetings and on my walks under the starry Arctic sky, Poor internet connection in the Southern Highlands made it difficult for me to continue attending those meetings. Your podcast has been a lifesaver. It now follows me in the woods where I meet foxes, deers, 
and moose. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, if you're listening right now, Stefan, <laughs> tell the foxes and deers and moose hello for me. That is great. He says, these walks are important to me as it allows me to connect with my higher power, bringing me serenity, and most importantly, making time for my wellness. I come from a long line of Alcoholics Anonymous, which included my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather. I grew up in a family business where alcohol was the trade, bar, restaurant, nightclub. Today, my dad would have turned 72, but he passed away at 57. One of my sons was also an alcoholic. He tried to quit very hard. He was battling his own demons. I even stopped drinking cold turkey to encourage him. I haven't picked up a drink since July 2020, but that was not enough. In September of that year, he decided to turn off the light of his life. This was the hardest thing a father could ever experience. A week before he passed, he posted a message that says, If you don't make time for your wellness, you will be forced to make time for your illness. Read that again. I'll read it again. He said a week before he passed, he posted a message that says, If you don't take time for your wellness, you will be forced to make time for your illness. Although he is not there anymore, I promised him and all of the sons that I will make time for my wellness. For too long, I neglected myself, always giving my 200% to others and putting myself second. I was getting sick. I was ill. I discovered 12-step programs in December of 2020. These communities helped me get out of the dark hole that I put myself into. I learned that I am not alone. That's right. He said, I first started with Al-Anon as my wife tried to drown her sorrow in the drink, but realized I was also raised to become an adult child of alcoholics, overachiever, enabler. I even found a fellowship for Workaholics Anonymous. I have been also listening to AA speakers as they help me connect with my past, my father, my son, but also myself. And although I did not go as deep as they did, Uh, But I became addicted to the excitement of work and helping others and enjoyed the drink. Although I told myself every Saturday morning that I would never drink again. Some of the speakers that resonated with me on your podcast include Billy Kay. I almost came to tears uh, down the middle of the road, but also Brian P. and Joe Muck. Uh, Part of my journey is to now connect with my higher power, opening myself up to God. For too long, I fed myself, provided everything we needed, needed, but starved my soul. I am now walking with God everywhere I go and along the path. I listen to the many stories of experience, strength, and hope shared by your amazing speakers. Thanks, John, for your service. God bless Stefani. And then there's some languages here that I have no idea what they're saying. Uh, and then there's, then there's English. And it says, before saying yes to someone else, make sure you're not saying no to yourself. Apparently he speaks, oh, I can tell it's French. And then there's some other language in English. Uh, you're a very bright man. You're speaking three languages there. I can barely keep up with one. But anyway, thank you, Stefani, for writing in. I am sorry about your losses. Um, and, uh, I'm glad though, that we here at Sober Speak can be a small part of your journey. Thanks for writing in. Brittany writes in and Brittany says, hi, John. My name is Brittany L. I live in the Albany area of upstate New York. I've been listening to your podcast since about a year ago or so. A friend told me about it a few months after I got sober. I started from EP1, (laughs) and I absolutely love your podcast. Your personality always brightens my day and puts a smile on my face. Well, you put a smile on my face too, Brittany. And she says, and I've... Uh, and I've gotten so much out of the nuggets of wisdom, wisdom, your guests, 
drop on a regular basis throughout your conversations. This podcast has helped me get through several difficult conundrums. Ooh, I like that. I've faced so far in my recovery. I listened to episode 169, Sober Speak Live with Gary K. Part 1, and this podcast saved my A blank blank once again. She put the blank blanks in there. Um, recently, my partner moved in with me temporarily while he's waiting for his new place to be ready. And his snoring really does a number on my sleep. Long story short, I went to the doctor for a routine checkup a week ago or so. And before I knew it, she was sending an ambient script to my pharmacy and my mouth fell, felt frozen shut despite my brain saying, uh, we aren't going to stop here, are we? Um, and then, uh, the Ambien has been sitting in my purse ever since unopened and unacknowledged. Then listening to Gary Kay in that episode, talk about how secrets keep us spiritually sick because the act of keeping the secret becomes more important than being with any other person. He's enabled me, Gary Kay. Uh, enabled me finally to open up that bottle and flush its contents down the to toilet. And tomorrow, since it's midnight currently, I'll call my sponsor and tell her everything. Thank you so much for your contribution <laughs> to my recovery. <laughs> You're welcome. Well done there, Brittany. Well done. Well played. She says, I have an immense gratitude for all that you do. Please add me to the super secret Facebook play, uh, to the super secret Facebook page. Uh, best wishes and happy holidays to you, you and your family, Brittany L. God bless you, Brittany. And <laughs> thank you for your contribution to a, a smile on my face today. I appreciate you. And I'm glad, uh, that, uh, Gary K put that out there on a podcast, and I've thought about what he has said many times on that uh, episode as well, uh, and I appreciate you bringing it up again. Rob writes in, and he says, hey man, my name is Rob R. I listened to the, pod I listened to the podcast in prison in Arkansas. I reached out to you, and then Brad contacted me to do some work. Yes, the one and only Mr. Brad W. here, local with me, who reaches out to uh, a lot of the inmates when I ask him to do such. So I'm glad he got in touch with you. He says, I recently got out of prison, is what he's saying. I'm in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where, uh, where I have been sober since July 24th. I love the podcast, and Charlie P., is the man. Yes, he is the man. In fact, I just saw you. It's interesting. You said, I just got a text from him while I'm recording this episode. I didn't stop to read it, obviously, but I just saw his name pop up. I have to go see what he said after I get uh, off uh, of the uh, microphone here, which I will be in just a moment. Uno momento. Jeffrey writes in, he says, hi, John, I am coming up on 21 years in AA in May 1st of 2023. Good for you, Jeffrey. He says, I found your podcast on audiobook, and I also found the Grapevine podcast. I have been listening to them both. I found that the podcast... I." Uh, I found that the podcast is starting with 270 and not the first one. Oh, what he's saying there is, is that the podcast on my end uh, for um, Sober Speak, it starts with the the latest content, the freshest content, however you want to put it, as opposed to the first one. I'm not sure I want many people listening to that first one anyway, because I didn't know what I was doing. But anyway, Jeffrey, that's just how they do it. They they put the 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 last one on first because they figure most people want to listen to that. But who knows? Uh, I don't know if there's a way to change that in your settings or not. But nonetheless, thank you for writing in, Jeffrey. And congratulations on your twenty or your nearly twenty one years in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. All right, everybody, that wraps up another episode. I think it's number two hundred seventy three here with Marina. Uh, God bless you. Uh, keep coming back. It works if you work it. Uh, may God bless you and keep you until then. I take this one week at a time. Hope to see you guys next week. And uh, until then, 
Love you guys. Be well.